Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to present our last speaker for the morning, um, Dr. Todd Ellerin, who is Chief of Infectious Disease at the South Shore Hospital. Um, he's also a member of our division and sees patients here at the, the Brigham. He's the Vice Chair of Medicine at South Shore Hospital, and he is the doctor's doctor. I always say when I get sick with an infectious disease, this is the man I would like to have take care of me. So Todd's going to talk to us about sexually transmitted disease. Todd, thanks for coming. Thanks. Too kind, uh, Jamie, thank you very much. Okay, so it's good to be here. I'm gonna do a rapid review of, of STI, sexually transmitted infections. And I think there's two points I wanna make from a big picture perspective. The first is I want you to think about um, ask, screen, intervene, okay? And I think the most important part of that is the first one, the ask. We have to learn how to become comfortable talking about sex with our patients. Um, so that, that's the first thing. And the second is I want you to think of prevention. Um, we're better at preventing these than treating these. So with that, we're gonna go ahead. Uh, this is my disclosure. So what's new? Um, when you go to the CDC um, uh, uh, website, uh, the first thing you notice is that there, these STIs are on the rise. Chlamydia, the most common, uh, 1.8 million cases. Um, uh, that's a 19% increase since 2014, so that's very relevant. Uh, gonorrhea, almost 600,000 cases, uh, over a 60% increase since 2014, so on and so forth. So, you know, when, when we're, we're asking ourselves, is this relevant to us? The answer is yes, we're seeing this more and more. And um, it's important that we screen our patients because, you know, as we'll see later on, many of our patients are asymptomatic and that can still cause problems, not only increased transmission, but also uh, end organ problems. So when we uh, consider prevention, I want you to look at this list and I'm not gonna go through it all, but these are all uh, important ways we can uh, pre prevent uh, STIs in our patients. And uh, one thing that is missing here actually is, is male circumcision as well. So that should be added to that. But um, they're, they're, this is a big topic and this is something we wanna consider uh, in, in all of our patients. All right, so first case, 24-year-old uh, black male, long-standing HIV, last CD4 count was 380, a viral load of 50,000 copies. He was lost to follow up for five years, not on any, any antivirals when you see him. He has a history of gonorrhea and general herpes type 2. He's treated episodically for the herpes, about two outbreaks per year. He presents with dysuria, painful ulcers surrounding his edematous uh, penile foreskin, and he has blood at the tip of his uh, uh, meatus. And um, his previous herpetic outbreaks had been unilateral. Uh, his small vesicles in the foreskin, which crusted over in days. His last herpetic outbreak had been several years ago, so it had been pretty well controlled. His HIV was acquired through unprotected heterosexual intercourse, and his last sex was four days prior with his girlfriend. He had no recent unprotected intercourse. And you can see here, this is his penis. You can see these ulcers, they go circumferential, okay, on the foreskin. And you can see here a little bit of hemorrhage at the urethral meatus. So what's the most likely cause of these painful ulcers? Okay, so if you can see these, good. All right, so excellent. So um, most of you thought that this was genital herpes in the setting of uh, uh, declining cell-mediated immunity, and that's exactly the correct answer. Syphilis, it would be un unusual to have you know, a very painful infection and, and that level of circumferential ulceration, although we always have to think of it. Chancroid is incredibly rare in the US. LGV does not present with multiple ulcers like that. You, you can have occasionally like an inoculation papule, and gonorrhea is not an ulcerative uh, infection. So I'll move on to the next slide now. And in fact, what this shows is that he had lost cell-mediated immunity. So he had developed AIDS in the interim, and that's the reason. This is very unusual to, to, to have a, a recurrence of HSV to, to have multiple ulcerations, but it's because he lost uh, immunity, and that's why that happened. And so um, the uh, STI treatment guidelines um, from MMWR were really last updated in 2015. They do have iterative 
um, updates that you can go online and it's a very helpful resource, um, but it's been about five years since they've had a complete update. So when we talk about general herpes, it's important to know over 50 million people in the US are infected with HSV2, Mo most are not aware of it. It's more common in women than men, almost twice as common. Um, remember, most up to 90% of people who are infected are unaware of their infection and they're periodically shedding virus. Okay, so that's why you can have transmission in the absence of lesions. Most transmissions occur in asymptomatic carriers who are shedding. And um, most clinical HSV uh, is actually caused by HSV-1 when you look at, when you look at um, uh, primary outbreaks. Uh, and recurrence and asymptomatic shedding are more common with genital HSV-2 than HSV-1. So people do ask the question, why is it important to know the difference whether I have type 1 or type 2? And it is very relevant because the overall um, a prognosis is very different. Type 2 recurs more, it sheds more, uh, and, and less of the population uh, is, is, or more of the population is susceptible to HSV2 because there is more background HSV1. When, when we talk about testing, you want to make sure that you're testing with type-specific antibodies. So the type of serology that distinguishes type 1 from type 2. Uh, in the past, people were, would sometimes get back um, uh, antibodies that didn't distinguish between type 1 and type 2. That's less relevant these days. And you can see the sensitivity and specificity of these tests. And um, I really consider uh, antibody testing most frequently when I'm dealing with ulcerative genital disease that's culture negative or PCR negative. Um, it is not recommended to screen for HSV2 as far as general STI screening. But um, if you do see someone who's at high risk or someone who's in a discordant relationship where one of the partners is HSV2 positive, then this is something you want to consider. Okay. And remember, it takes time for the HSV2 IgG antibody to develop. On average, 50% become positive after three weeks. Okay, by three months, 90% of patients have seroconverted. So consider that if you're looking at someone who you think is herpes, but they're antibody, uh, they're antibody negative. You may want to repeat that in a few months. And then this is a, a pretty famous study that came out back in 2004. And what it looked at was about 1,484 discordant partners where one had genital herpes, the other didn't. These were in heterosexual couples. And um, they gave the, the, the source, the, the positive partner, valacyclovir 500 milligrams a day or placebo. And it was an eight-month study. A condoms and safer sex counseling was, was um, uh, recommended at each visit. And after about eight months, what it showed was the patients that were on um, valacyclovir, their partners were 77% were, were less likely to develop symptomatic infection and 50%, just under 50% li uh, less likely to develop seroconversion. So um, uh, taking this um, antiviral every day does decrease risk of transmission if the partner who's positive has uh, frequent symptomatic outbreaks. And now there is FDA approval for this indication. So when you look at common ulcerative diseases, well, first of all, we have the very common, which is herpes simplex. We have definitely increasing in frequency, but not nearly as common syphilis. But we are seeing that more and more, especially in the MSM population. And then of course we see chancroid, which is extremely rare. Okay, and with herpes, it's painful. There's often many papules. Uh, and it, as I said, it's common. Syphilis tends to be painless, okay, unless it's super infected, which also is not really that common. So it tends to be painless, often uh, associated with small lymphadenopathy. With syphilis, you always want to treat, you always want to treat as you're waiting for that result. If you suspect syphilis, you don't want to wait for the test result to come back. You want to start initiating treatment for that. And we'll go to the next slide. So when evaluation of a patient with a genital ulcer, history and physical, which we of course do on all patients, can often be inaccurate. So you want to send those screening tests, um, serologic tests for syphilis. If the serology is negative, you want to repeat that uh, uh, between one and three months later. Uh, for HSV testing of, a, of a, um, an ulcer, the PCR is much more sensitive than culture or antigen tests. So you really want to think about using your PCR in these patients. 
Uh, and then for, for MSMs, with, with, if you're thinking about the possibility of LGV, lymphogranuloma venarium, serology is, is best. You're looking, that's for chlamydia trachomatis and the um, L1 to L3 serovars you're looking for. And, and you can also do chlamydia PCRs or, or the NATS, the nucleic acid amplification testing. But remember, consider have a low threshold for empiric therapy. All right, the next case penile funk. I'm going to show you a few images. Okay. And this is one of my, um, this is one of my HIV positive patients. And um, he presented with this. And then this was his foot. You can see these papular squamous eruption. And then the, 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 here are his hands. And at this point, I have a sense that most of you know what this is. And this is called the split papule. You can actually see the Palmer hand crease go right through it on both hands. Very unusual in dermatology for the, for the lines of cleavage in the hands to actually cut right through. And then this is a perianal papule, broad-based. And I'm sure you are thinking that this is syphilis and absolutely this is syphilis. The last slide I showed you, if we go back to this, this is, uh, this is a syphilitic wart. This is what we call condyloma lata, as opposed to the, the, the condyloma acuminatum, the, the, the genital wart of HPV that looks more like a cauliflower with fronds. This is teeming with spirochetes, okay? You do not want to have sex with that. That's a surefire way of, of acquiring syphilis. So with syphilis, painless ulcers, think syphilis, test and, then, uh, uh, and, and treat empirically. The rash often involves the palms and soles of you, as, as we saw. Um, with early syphilis, primary and secondary, we wanna treat all sex partners in the last 90 days. Uh, um, all, all patients uh, and sex partners after 90 days can be tested. So if they've had sex more than 90 days before, their partners can be tested. And if that's negative, they don't need treatment. But all sex partners within the last three months should be treated irrespective of the test. Um, and then we want to follow patients to make sure their RPR has fallen by fourfold. That means if they had a RPR titer of 1 to 32, you want to make sure that it falls to at least um, 1 to 8. Okay, that would be a fourfold decrease. Oftentimes, the RPR does ultimately over time become non-reactive, but some patients stay what's called serofast, where their titer remains positive. As long as they've fallen at least fourfold and are asymptomatic and we're not concerned about ongoing syphilis, that's reasonable. They do not have to be retreated. As far as screening patients with RPRs, that can lead to false positive results. So many centers uh, um, including the Brigham, have changed to um, a, a specific treponemal test to screen. And when you do that, that avoids false positive RPRs. Occasionally, we do get a scenario where someone is treponemal test positive, but their RPR is non-reactive. In those cases, the first question you want to ask them is, have they had syphilis before and, if, and have they been treated for that? And oftentimes the answer is yes. And, um, and that's the reason that they have a negative RPR. But sometimes there may be a low risk person. You are, are actually wondering, could it be a false positive uh, um, treponemal test? And then what happens is you wanna send another treponemal test. And if that test is negative and they're not high risk, then we usually call it a, a false positive and don't treat. These are cases that you may wanna to refer to your infectious disease colleagues for sure. Syphilis serology is the only thing I really want to point out here is for primary infection, you can see uh, stage one primary syphilis. You can really have 20, 20 to 30% can be false negative early on. So that's important to remember. So don't be fooled. If you see something that could be a chancre, you think they may have syphilis, treat them, even if the, even if the RPR comes back non-reactive. And in fact, we should have treated them anyways before the result came back. This just shows that highly infectious condyloma lata in a woman, uh, multiple here, you know, very, very contagious at this stage. The prozone reaction, um, you, you can see what the, the technology is here. It's nonspecific, um, but uh, what it basically says is that if you have a lot of antigen and a lot of antibody, if you have spirochetes in your blood, okay, you're in stage two syphilis, okay? you really 
it's possible that you could have a false negative RPR because of a prozone reaction where you have excess antibodies and and it, it just it, it causes a, a negative test because you don't have the antibodies and antigen uh, linking together. Um, so that's important. And that can happen with an excess of antigen or antibody. So if you see someone that you think you're like, wow, this really sounds like syphilis. I don't have an alternative diagnosis, but my RPR is non-reactive. You want to call that micro lab and say, I really think this is syphilis. Can you make sure, can you dilute down the specimen to prove that this isn't a prozone reaction? So with neurosyphilis, um, this can be a, a tricky diagnosis. Our neuro, neuro, neurology colleagues can be very helpful with it. Uh, it's important to note that it can occur at any stage. Patients can be asymptomatic or they can present with meningitis, cranial nerve palsies, uh, general paresis, which is sort of a dementing type illness, tabes dorsalis, which are posterior columns. They can have sort of a toxic gait. Uh, meningovascular disease can sometimes look like strokes or meningitis. Uh, auditory hearing loss, optic neuritis, they can have a red eye or blurred vision. So all of these things can be part of neurosyphilis. You, this can really be a, a great mimicker. And um, it's important to really consider this and to have a low threshold to treat empirically in these patients and to tap, to do spinal, uh, spinal tap in these patients. The CSF VDRL, if it's positive, that, is, that certainly is specific, but it's insensitive. Many of our patients with neurosyphilis will have a negative uh, CSF uh, VDRL. Remember that, that's an important take home. Um, so if you have uh, a pleocytosis with more than four or five white cells or, or an elevated protein or a low glucose and you're thinking syphilis, that's enough to empirically treat even if the VDRL is negative. Indications for a spinal tap. Clearly, if your patient has what you think is neurosyphilis or, or ocular or otic syphilis, you want to uh, consider an LP. If they have active tertiary disease, you want to consider if they have aortitis, that may be someone that you want to do an LP on. Treatment failure is very important. Um, uh, the spirochetes can be sequestered in the CSF, and that could be a reason why your patient is failing. It's very controversial whether patients with who are HIV positive should automatically get um, lumbar punctures. I think over time we're moving away from just just uh, kind of knee jerking doing an LP just because the patient is HIV. Now it may be different if they have advanced AIDS and you really you know they have a lot of things going on and you want to really rule out neurosyphilis. Then I think it makes more sense to do. If patients have a high RPR titer more than uh, or equal to one to thirty two, you you may want to consider a, uh, an LP. Again, that's a good reason to give us a call and to go through it with, um, with those of us who've had um, you know, more experience with neurosyphilis. Uh, the CSF should be followed after treatment until normal. Um, you, can, you can tap at six months and up to two years. I will say that there's some guidance that shows that if you treat a patient and they symptomatically improve and their RPR falls to non-reactive and does exactly what it's supposed to do, there have been studies that show that the CSF actually tracks with that. So unclear whether you absolutely have to do it. But I think if this were a board's question, it's important that we want to follow up our, our um, neurosyphilis with, with repeat LPs. And again, uh, just a reminder, the goal is a sustained fourfold decrease in titer and symptom resolution. All right, the titer doesn't have to go to non-reactive, but it has to fall at least fourfold and symptom resolution. And testing intervals for syphilis in general, if patients have primary or secondary syphilis, you want to repeat that RPR at 6 and 12 months. If they have late syphilis, that would be 6, 12, 18, and 24 months. So that would be every six months as well. And then if they have HIV infection, we are more aggressive with repeating their, their um, RPR. And you can see here that it's really every three months for the first year and then one year later. And most of our HIV patients do respond to therapy. And definitions of treatment failure, if signs or symptoms uh, persist, or if you fail to achieve a fourfold decrease in titer within six to 12 months, then that would be considered failure. Or if you have a sustained fourfold in increase. So remember our patient that went down to a titer of one to eight, if they go up to a titer of one to 16 and they're completely asymptomatic, we don't do anything with that. But if their titer goes up to one to 32, again, a fourfold increase, then that is considered a, a, a 
a, a real increase and you'd have to retreat. Management of treatment failure and HIV test, which of course should have been done. A reminder, uh, about almost 50% of our patients who have syphilis, uh, who are MSM, will be HIV positive. So that's really important to keep in mind. A CSF analysis, as I mentioned, with uh, failure. And if the CSF doesn't normalize after treatment um, with, with IV therapy, then you really want to do benzathine penicillin weekly for three weeks. All right, so uh, very important. All right, next case. Um, and just a reminder, if I didn't say this, for neurosyphilis, we do treat with intravenous therapy, okay, IV penicillin, and that's a 10 to 14 day treatment. So it does require a line and, 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 and prolonged intravenous therapy. All right, next case. This is a 34 year old male with fever, rash, and a headache. He was well until seven days prior when he developed a sore throat, anorexia, diarrhea, and a non paritic rash. He's uh, somewhat ill-appearing, very high fevers, as you can see, over 103. His uh, left uh, um, uh, tonsil has uh, an ulcer that's painful. He has mild generalized lymphadenopathy and diffuse maculopapular exanthema on his body, greatest on his neck, back, trunk, and arms, spares his hands. His white count's 5.1. You can see the diff, 53% polys, 11% bands, 28% lymphocytes, eight monocytes, and no atypical lymphs. His platelet count is 125,000, so slightly low, and his ALT is a little high at 88, about twice normal, and the remainder of the labs are normal. And this is an example of his back, as you can see this maculopapular rash, and you can see on his left tonsil, he has a painful ulcer. And as you can see in the workup, he was strep negative. Uh, his um, uh, uh, monospot was negative. His syphilis testing was negative. His CMV showed that he is IgM negative and had had it uh, in the past. HEP A and HEP B testing so it showed no evidence of, of acute infection. And his HIV antigen antibody was also negative. So what do we think the most likely diagnosis is? Okay, so um, ex excellent. Most of you, almost two thirds, uh, think this is acute HIV and that's exactly what this was. Uh, this is not easy for those of you who are thinking syphilis, that's really important. You may say, wow, this could have been one of those prozone uh, cases uh, that we just mentioned before, and that's absolutely true. Uh, okay, the rash wasn't on his palms and soles, but it doesn't have to be. Um, Epstein-Barr virus um, usually doesn't cause a rash unless you challenge them with an antibiotic, but occasionally it can. So all of these are possible. A uh, primary HSV gingivostomatitis absolutely could have been part of that ulcer, but would definitely not have explained the maculopapular rash. Um, so, so excellent. His viral load was greater than 750,000 copies, and this was acute HIV. And of course, this is someone that you want to get into treatment, get on to get on therapy, um, you know, as quickly as possible. Next case: a 27-year-old male with tender swelling in the left groin. You can see that big lymph node there. He has multiple sex partners. You could think about what you think the most likely diagnosis is. And if you were thinking LGV, that's exactly what this is. And if you haven't heard of LGV, well, this is a good time to review. Um, that's lymphogranuloma venarium. And it's caused by chlamydia. Now, it's caused by chlamydia trachomatis, but certain types, uh, what's called these L types, usually L1 through L3. And, and so, it, yes, chlamydia, we know of chlamydia trachomatis, but this, these are uh, specific types. The primary incubation period is, is usually within a month. Um, the papule patients can get a, a small ulcer or papule. It can be very indistinct and, and very missable. Um, and as you can see, it can look like syphilis. It could look like herpes, um, but it's often painless. Um, the secondary stage, that's the stage that's really more in your face, okay? You saw the bubo in the case I uh, uh, just described, um, but patients can also get proctitis. And that's something I want you to think about. I'm dealing with a patient that I just saw who I think has LGV and he, he's presenting with mucus discharge and bloody discharge uh, and, and he's at high risk uh, uh, because of receptive 
uh, uh, unprotected receptive anal intercourse, okay? So um, the board's question, you're probably either gonna see a large bubo uh, below or above the inguinal crease, or it's gonna be a, a patient that presents with almost like an ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease presentation in someone who's at high risk for an STI. Uh, Long-term complications can be chronic ulceration, fistula strictures, the strictures could be like Crohn's or, or um, genital elephantiasis. The best way to make the diagnosis is either serology, we send serologic tests for the, for the um, uh, L, L1 to L3 serovars of chlamydia trachomatis. And if you have a positive 1 to 64 or higher, then you absolutely will consider um, LGV. Um, or you can do nucleic acid amplification looking for the chlamydia um, PCRs. Again, this is the type of diagnosis that's not easy. And you want to really consider getting these patients on doxycycline before you get your test results back. If the test results are negative and you think there's an alternative diagnosis, you can always have them stop the doxycycline, okay? And this is just an example of a primary lesion of LGV, um, certainly something that can be missed, okay? Not like the, the case of, of general herpes that I, that I showed you. This is a little different. This is an anal stricture. That's not gonna be missed, but you may think that this, or, 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 or we may think that this is a more likely to be Crohn's disease or something. So um, you need to think about that. So we wanna treat suspect cases with uh, doxycycline. The interesting thing here is it's 21 days, okay? So longer than we treat um, a run of the mill chlamydia where we usually do seven days of doxy, or you can do as if, if they're allergic to doxy or have had a reaction, you could do one gram a week of azithromycin for three weeks. And we wanna treat asympto asymptomatic sex partners as well as you can see. So now we'll move to non-ulcerative STIs. So here you can see clinical manifestations of gonorrhea. One of the things that gonorrhea doesn't do is, is ulcerations generally, but you can see urethritis, epididymitis, cervicitis, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, proctitis, uh, pharyngitis. These are all pretty common manifestations of gonorrhea, whereas disseminated infection is definitely less common, okay? Uh, conjunctivitis. Uh, can be seen as well. And very rare are meningitis, hepatitis, and endocarditis. Most patients we see, it's more urethritis or cervicitis, epididymitis, or PID or proctitis. Those are probably the most common, these, these, these five here. And you can see here, these gram-negative intracellular, gram-negative diplococci, that's characteristic of gonorrhea. Diagnosis, most of the time these days, we are using the nucleic acid amplification test, the PCR. And the good news is you can use it on the urine generally. It, 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 it's a very sensitive test. So that's very helpful. Uh, the gram stain can be very sensitive in, in males who have urethritis. Otherwise, the gram stain can have low sensitivity. Okay. Importantly, use of fluoroquinolones for over, you know, almost... Uh, 15 years, we've been saying we cannot use fluoroquinolones empirically because of increased resistance. Okay, very important. So the treatment for gonorrhea, and this is this has been this has been out really for the past eight years, is ceftriaxone plus doxycycline or plus azithromycin. Ceftriaxone alone is not enough, and it's not to treat the chlamydia. Even if your chlamydia testing is negative, you still want to use ceftriaxone um, um, plus doxy or azithromycin. That's important. Okay. Alternatives, you can use piosafixime, but it's not recommended. So if you do that and you obviously have to add doxy or azithromycin, you need to, to do a test of cure in a week because we don't trust the PO as much as we trust uh, um, ceftriaxone. If you have a true beta-lactam allergy like anaphylaxis, you wanna consider azithromycin. Um, there's some other, you can use uh, gemofloxacin and azithro um, or genomycin plus azithro, but these are very unusual. You'd have to have real severe allergies and, uh, in order to get uh, on this, on this uh, uh, protocol. Um, and importantly, we wanna rescreen these patients at three months, ideally. Again, that's not a test of cure, but that's to rescreen because they're at high risk of, of getting it again, um, and at least within a year if they haven't come back within three months. And now we'll move to chlamydia. 
Chlamydia is the most frequently reported um, uh, bacterial STI in the United States by far. Um, some of the viral infections like herpes and, and HPV obviously can rival it um, from, from viral STIs, but from bacterial STIs, chlamydia is by far the most common. Notice the, the, the serotypes here, D through K. Remember with, um, with the uh, LGV, we talked about the L serovar. So that's, that's more trivia than anything else. But at least 75% of women and 50% of men have no symptoms. That is extremely important. Very, very important to, to, to remember that. That's why I remember at the, at the uh, outset, I said, ask, screen, intervene. Whenever we're talking about STIs, I think if you keep that in mind, then um, you're gonna do well by your patients. Rapid diagnostic tests have allowed for easier office testing. Why do we care about chlamydia? Well, so what? You're asymptomatic because up to 40% of women with untreated chlamydia will develop pelvic inflammatory disease. And why is that relevant? Because 20% will become infertile, almost 20% will have chronic pelvic pain, and about 10% will have an ectopic pregnancy. So this is meaningful, and we want to follow the uh, national guidelines for screening women with chlamydia. Um, Two CDC asymptomatic screening studies have resulted in a decline in overall infection rates. So asymptomatic screening does do something. And of course, the other thing you're thinking is it will prevent um, transmission from men. And then if it decreases transmission to men, it will decrease transmission from men back to women, at least in, 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 in heterosexual relationships. So I think that's very important. We don't, there's no recommendation for routinely screening men for chlamydia. That's different among the MSM population. And we'll, we'll come to that later. So the recommendation is to screen women under 25 years annually for chlamydia. And if they're, 20, if they're 25 or older, then if they're at higher risk, then we wanna screen them. And we talked about the no routine screening for men, but you can screen certainly if it's a if you think it's a high risk person, an adolescent, or if they're if it's a man that's coming to an STD clinic, correctional facilities. There are exceptions. <clears throat> so as far as rescreening, just like for gonorrhea, we want to rescreen all women with chlamydia after about three to four months. And again, reminder: rescreening is. is distinct from retesting. And what we don't want to do is, especially if you've made the diagnosis through PCR testing or that NAT, you don't want to test within the first three or four weeks with a NAT because the, that nucleic acid amplification test, if once you're positive, you're often positive uh, up to at least three or four weeks later. So you really want to wait for at least a month to do a retesting if your patient has ongoing symptoms. And except in pregnant women, test of cure is not recommended. In pregnant women, we do need a test of cure. So now I want to just uh, finish the last few minutes going through um, a cases. So this is a 51-year-old MSM who's HIV positive, CD4 count greater than 500, viral load undetectable on a single tablet regimen. Uh, he was informed that one of his recent partners had oral gonorrhea. So the question is, how should this patient be managed, okay? And um, since we don't have the question, I'm gonna show you here. So if you were thinking that someone with oral gonorrhea, we should treat with ceftriaxone um, plus either azithromycin or doxycycline, you're absolutely correct. Remember, he had a partner with, with gonorrhea, so we have to treat with ceftriaxone, but that's not enough. Uh, in the past, many years ago, you know, over a decade ago, um, ceftriaxone would have been enough for gonorrhea. And then if, they, if we ruled out chlamydia, uh, we could have just used ceftriaxone monotherapy. But these days, the, we're, we're worried about increasing kind of MIC creep, increasing resistance, uh, maybe not complete resistance, but, but a sort of a, a trend in the wrong direction. So we want to add either azithromycin or doxycycline for seven days, okay? So that, that, that's important. Um, and it's not, and that's even if the patient tests negative for chlamydia, all right? So patient did well for two days after ceftriaxone plus azithro, and then he landed in Berlin and developed tenesmus, bloody discharge, and fevers. He was given doxycycline and flew back home after six days without much improvement. I will tell you that this case sounds very similar to a patient I just saw before this talk. Um, his PCP informed him that his testing prior to his trip showed positive rectal chlamydia, but negative 
gonorrhea testing. Okay, I think that's surprising for all of us, um, but it, it, and his CT scan showed proctitis. The question is, what is the most likely STI causes of proctitis? And I'll just tell you them, and, and, and let's see what you think. So um, syphilis, herpes, chlamydia, or all of the above. And if you're thinking all of the above, you're absolutely correct. Let's go to the next slide, please. That's right. So, so, so all of these can cause proctitis. And I don't think I mentioned gonorrhea, but chlamydia, gonorrhea, HSV, syphilis, all of these can cause proctitis. Um, and it's very important to consider all of these. So his, his HSV2 PCR returned positive. Remember, this was of a rectal swab, and he was started on valacyclovir. His syphilis testing was negative, and all his GC testing, his gonorrhea testing was negative. But his LGV antibody testing returned highly positive at 1 to 128 for chlamydia trachomatis L2 serovar. Okay, so again, very complicated case. We have a patient who was exposed to someone with gonorrhea, had unprotected receptive anal intercourse, and ultimately has had rectal LGV and herpes, okay? Um, so he was discharged on valacyclovir, 1,000 milligrams uh, twice daily for seven days, followed by suppressive therapy, okay? And then doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for three weeks. Um, and he, uh, he improved after this and, and has done well. Okay, so if we move on now to screening guidelines for, for uh, uh, men who have sex with men. So this is a little different than um, uh, for heterosexual patients. So HIV testing should be done annually. Syphilis serology with confirmatory testing if positive should be done annually. Uh, you can see here, depending on the type of, of sex they have, it's important to know what mucosal membranes patients are using. We have to be able to talk to our patients in a non-judgmental way. I say, are you a top, are you a bottom, or do you have insertive intercourse or receptive intercourse? That's sort of the type of questions I ask when I'm talking to my patients in general. I say, do you have sex with men, women, or both? It's important that if we feel comfortable talking to our patients, our patients will feel comfortable. So urethral or urinary GC and chlamydia, if they're an insertive partner, a rectal GC and chlamydia, uh, if they're a receptive partner, and we want to use our PCR testing as much as possible. A pharyngeal gonorrhea, uh, the gnats are preferred um, if they have receptal oral intercourse. I know a lot of, a lot of people do send for chlamydia as well. Um, that's not in the guidelines, but um, I understand that sometimes it does come back positive. Um, consider serologic evaluation for HSV2, but that's just to consider um, uh, hep B surface antigen. We need to know our patients' hep B, uh, whether they have active hep B or not. And hep C, again, not in the guidelines, but I would recommend it in your patients who are having receptive anal intercourse. We, we have seen some outbreaks of hep C in, in the MSM population, uh, those who are having our unprotected receptive anal intercourse. Vaccinate against hep A and hep B, that's very important. Remember I talked about in the beginning, at the outset, prevention is so important. And we really want to screen uh, perhaps every six months if, if, uh, if our patients have multiple anonymous partners. Once a year may not even be enough. And then uh, just the last, uh, really, I think just the last slide, what about recurrent urethritis? So uh, we want to think about mycoplasma genitalium. It can cause up to 20% of, of male non-gonococcal urethritis and about 30% if our patients have recurrent uh, persistent urethritis. The pathogenic role of, of M genitalium in, in, in females is a little less clear because the majority tend to be asymptomatic, but it can be seen in up to 10 to 30% of females uh, who have clinical cervicitis. What's very important about mycoplasma genitalium is that doxy is ineffective. So you really want to use a macrolide like azithromycin if you're thinking about that. If your patient has a macrolide allergy, then you want to use moxifloxacin. And then trichomonas, uh, if your patient tests positive for trich, if they're a female, you want to rescreen after three months. And remember, your nucleic acid amplification testing, your PCR, is, is more sensitive than your wet mouth. And then lastly, um, annual hep C patients, uh, hep C testing for HIV positive patients. And patients who are diagnosed and treated for urethritis should abstain from sex for at least a week 
after treatment of the patient and the partner. And again, remember retesting three months later to detect repeat uh, infection. And remember your HPV-9 vaccines, very important for girls and boys age nine up to 26. And it's approved for adults age 27 to 45 and recommended for those who are at higher risk of acquiring it. Um, and with that, I'll stop and can take any questions or. Hey, Todd, thank you very, very much. That was absolutely terrific. Yeah. And we thank have a bunch, bunch, bunch of questions for you. Okay. Uh, so the first is, how long is it safe to have patients on suppressive therapy for herpes simplex virus infection? Yeah, well, as it, as it turns out, these antivirals, including acyclovir, and we have the most data on acyclovir, they're very, very safe. So we have, we have decades of experience with acyclovir. And with valacyclovir now, we're probably, we're probably somewhere between around the 15-year mark uh, or maybe even longer where we've had patients on this safely. So I, think, I, think, I, I, I don't think there's any safety issues. But remember, periodically, you do want to test your patient because they may have acquired herpes. And at that point, if they have, there's no reason to keep them on suppressive therapy. Okay, great. A couple other herpes questions. Um, two about anatomical distribution. So how often do you see a lymph node involvement near the lesion site? And second, someone had rectal herpes years ago, and they present with herpes in the buttock area. How common do you see that? Okay, both. But so, so with primary HIV outbreak, that fir first time HSV outbreak, primary HSV, it's very common to have those big uh, lymph nodes. With recurrent HSV, usually the lymph nodes are much less common, or they're or they're very small. Um, with rectal H with re rectal HSV, we do have patients who have buttock lesions. I have one patient who who we had to put on suppressive therapy because they were getting a buttock lesion almost every month and almost in the same place. And initially, it was thought to be shingles, and then they were referred. And 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 remember, shingles while it can recur, almost never recurs in the same dermatome. So if you have a blister that's recurring in the same dermatome, you want to think about HSV, herpes simplex. Great, great. A couple of syphilis questions. Um, have a new patient with a positive RPR, titer one to two, never been treated, never had the diagnosis before. Do you treat him? Okay, so uh, I do need to know, first of all, what their risk factors are like. And then, of course, is there is their treponemal test positive? If their treponemal test is positive, absolutely, we would treat. Um, but if the treponemal test is negative, then remember that could be a false positive RPR. So need to know more information. Terrific. And then how, how often do you, uh, when should you start rechecking the syphilis titer, the RPR titer after treatment? Okay, so that depends if they're HIV positive or negative. Remember, and I didn't say this, and I should have. When you see one STD or STI, you want to you want to test for all of them. So if the person's HIV positive, then you're gonna their next test is gonna be every three months, and I do have a slide to go over that. If they're HIV negative and it's early disease, uh, the next time would be six months later. Great, great. And uh, how how confident are you in the? Um, the nucleic, nucleic acid amplification tests for, for gonorrhea and chlamydia. How confident are you? These are very good tests, um, especially in the in, in the uh, general locations. I mean, I think these are these are they're much more sensitive than culture for for gonorrhea, chlamydia. We don't really culture routinely, so I think these are excellent tests. I think the sensitivities are often in the ninety plus percent range. Terrific. Thank thank you very very much, Todd. 